Today I want to talk to you about the beauty and satisfaction that can be found in God-given gender. The beauty and satisfaction that can be found in God-given gender. Uh, yesterday I was flipping through Facebook, as I normally do just to kill some brain cells, and a video of a young trans girl popped up. And it, was a, it was a boy, born a boy, who has now become a girl. And she said something that stuck with me as I was thinking about this message today. He said, when I was born, the doctor said, with joy, it is a boy. He was so wrong. That just struck me. This child, the, the, the doctor is happy, rejoicing. You've got a boy. And this young boy now says, no, the doctor was all wrong. In this young man's mind, when the doctor looked at his physical body and declared his gender, he's a boy. He was mistaken. And this young man, born a man, decided that he was, in effect, made wrong. But is there no reason to continue in the gender that God has given us? Is there no value in staying in and becoming what God made you? Was this young trans boy wrong? Right. Was the doctor wrong? Was he made all wrong? Let's consider this question this morning. We'll look at two verses to do this. The first verse we've already read. We're going to look at this one here for the most, uh, most of the service today, and then the second one right at the end. 1 Corinthians 11 says something about men and women and starts to show us what their, the value is inherent in being born a man or being born a woman. Paul said, For a man is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. We're going to get into that here in just a moment. And then in Jeremiah 1.5, very fascinating verse, especially on the subject of life and even gender. Before I formed you, God said, before I formed you, Jeremiah, in the womb, I knew you. Before you ever had a body, God knew you. All right, so we're going to talk about these verses. But I want to go back, before we do that, I want to go back to a question that I posed at the end of our last session on this subject. When we were talking about God and we looked at God made two genders. He made a, a man and he made a woman, and that's all that he made. But then we said, well, look, if God only made a woman and a man, why are, do people get confused with their gender? Why, why do they get confused if God has only made one or the other? Why do people struggle with gender? There are two reasons people struggle with gender, and I'm going to call Brother Ken up here to the front here to help me. All right, so just turn and face the crowd. All right. This is going to be Davy, okay? This is a 10-year-old little boy, Davy. You feel 10? I do. You don't have to tell us how old you really are. <laughs> so why do people struggle with gender confusion if God only made a man and a woman? Why are people confused? There are two reasons. The first is the pull of sin and the flesh. The pull of sin and the flesh. In Romans chapter 7, Paul said, I see another law in my members. He said, I see a law inside of me, something that is affecting me all the time. War, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. So what we have here is that all human beings have this inward pull towards wickedness. You see, he's resisting it, but it's always there, isn't it? Have you ever felt that? That pull, it's kind of like the leaning tower of Pisa. We're always leaning in the wrong direction. So our flesh pulls us towards sin. So that causes us all always to fall to sin very easily, doesn't it? Do you ever, you ever um, astounded by how easily you sin? You pray about this sin and you fight this sin and you fight this sin and all of a sudden something happens and boom, you fall to it. You see that? That's because you are always being pulled towards sin. So all of us in general are pulled towards all kinds of sins. That is because of this law of sin that is in us. It's a result of the curse upon us, the curse of death. But Davy here, not only does he fall to generally, general sin, any kind of sin in general, but each of us, Davy included, has some particular sins that cause him a lot of difficulty. Each one of us has probably two or three sins that sort of dog us our whole lives. They're just very hard for us. Some, some men uh, take their first drink of alcohol and that's it then alcohol has them, and it pulls them, and it just they can never seem to get away from it. Other sins they can put away pretty easily. 
So some people do that. Like my dad was that way. Now, I, I used to drink, but I was able to put it away pretty easily. But some people don't. Some people lying is one of those sins. Some people pride or, or anger is a sin, and it's just they always fight it, right? So some people are drawn and pulled towards homosexual behavior. They feel in them they don't necessarily want it, but they feel this urge and this draw towards the same sex. That is, let's, that is what, what causes a lot of people to get into homosexuality. Well, Davy here, and this, he's an illustration. This is, he's not Davy. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not prognosticating on him in any way, okay? But he's representing Davy. Davy's a 10-year-old little boy, and for some reason he feels being drawn to be a girl. That's for him. That's very hard. So that's the first reason that people end up moving towards something that God didn't make them as because of the lure, the pull, the constant pull of sin in their life, all right? But the second is the influence of the world. The influence of the world. 1 Corinthians 10.33, Paul says, and I quote this to you often because it's a very important verse to get into your head, to teach you how easy it is for you to be pulled into a sin that you otherwise have no interest in. Do not be deceived, he said. Evil company corrupts good habits. And in the context here, as I've mentioned to you before, this context, that should be 1 Corinthians 15, 33, I think, not, not 10. The context is the resurrection. Some people were denying the resurrection because of the people they were around. So here's what happens. You see this picture here whispering. Here's what happens. Davy has this pull anyway, right? But here's what the world does. Hey, Davy, aren't you confused about your gender? You know, everybody's doing it now. It's okay. And, you know, they brought in that drag queen at, sh at school the other day. Did you see that drag queen? See how much fun that drag queen was having? You really want to, you, you want to be a girl, don't you? You don't want to be a boy. Being a boy is bad. Boys are bad. Look how bad men are. That's the influence of the world, isn't it? Yep. And so the, these young people, they hear it constantly, left and right. Social media, education, TV, movies. We've got Buzz Lightyear, somebody on that kissing another girl. They just see it all the time, all the time. And it starts to weigh on them and it starts to influence them to something they may not even be naturally inclined to. There is uh, an article that I read by a, a woman. Uh, the website is Parents with Inconvenient Truths About Trans, PITT.org, I think. And it's parents who are sharing their stories about what they're seeing with their children where the trans thing is concerned. And here's what she said about her daughter and her daughter's friends. Let's listen to this. She says, my teenage daughter has decided that she is trans. So have all her friends. Not some of them, not most of them. Every single one. She goes on. She had never heard of trans and had no signs of gender dysphoria. That means confusion. Until she was moved to a new, cool, trans-friendly school. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. There she met a group of geeky, slightly, but not very gender non-conforming artsy kids. As I understand it, they all discovered trans together. So here's what we have. We have Davy here. Davy's got a sin nature, so he's drawn towards evil anyway. He's really easy, easy to pull him over. And then he's got this thing going on where he's feeling this really weird thing inside that, that he, he feels like a woman or a girl. And so the world comes along, and so he's got this pull, right? And then the world comes along and starts whispering. And he doesn't have a chance. And that is why. You can take that off now. See, aren't you glad you're thin? Amen. That is why so many young people are becoming trans because they have that nature and then they have the world pulling them almost too powerfully into that evil. But the draw to sin is always an illusion, isn't it? I like to call it it's spiritual, spiritual mania or, or spiritual uh, mental breakdown. It's crazy. It's, a, it's an illusion. Resisting the flesh in the world and instead adopting God's design always leads to greater joy and happiness, doesn't it? How is this true with gender? Let's take a few minutes to consider that now. Let's look at the beauty and satisfaction in being what God made you to be and being 
the gender God gave you. Let's look at that. We'll do this first. We'll look in great depth at this verse here. 1 Corinthians eleven seven. 7. Paul said, For a man is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. What is Paul talking about here? This is very odd, isn't it? Because we know that God, man was made in the image of God. But in this text it says the man is the image and glory of God and the woman is the glory of the man. So what is Paul talking about here? And how does this relate to the beauty and satisfaction in gender? Let's look at this. We're going to first focus on two words. Let's make sure we understand these two words before we go on. The word image. In very simple terms, the word image means simply to be like someone. To be like someone. What this is saying is that a man is like God in a way that a woman is not. This is not to say that a woman is not made in the image of God. It simply means that man bears a special likeness to God. A likeness we'll talk about here in just a moment. And then the word glory. Glory in simple terms means to show how great someone is. So man is the image of God. He is like God in a unique way over the woman. And therefore he is God's glory. He shows God's greatness. Man shows how great God is in a unique and, again, different way than a woman does. The woman, per Paul, shows the greatness of the man. Again, this is not to say that a woman does not show God's greatness. It just means that in the certain way Paul is talking about, she shows the glory of the man as opposed to the glory of God. But how so? Let's look at this statement First, how is man the image and glory of God? Let's get to the bottom of this mystery by looking at this statement. We need to look at this and learn about this from the book of Genesis. This, Paul is taking us back to Genesis. He's saying man is like God and shows his greatness because of the reason he was made in the first place. That's how you see this difference. You go back to Genesis and see what God says about the reason a man was made to start with. So let's go there. Let's look at humanity's purpose. God gives him his purpose in Genesis 1.28. He gives humanity its purpose in Genesis 1.28. So let's look at this. Genesis 1.28. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Here God is directly telling the first people, Adam and Eve, what their purpose is. This is why you exist. This is what I want you to do now that I've made you and all the animals and all the world. There are actually four commands here. The four commands of man is critical for understanding the roles of men and women and the beauty and satisfaction in each one. So let's look at these four here briefly. The four commands of man given in the garden to our first parents. The first is to be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. God is commanding them, have children and increase in number. I don't want you to live a life all alone. I don't want you and Eve to just kind of chill and go on vacations and, and explore. I want you to have children. And later on in the Bible, we learn that the reason for the covenant of marriage, at least one of the reasons for the covenant of marriage, is to produce godly offspring. God desires godly children, and He showed this right here. That's number one. Be fruitful and multiply. The second is fill the earth. That means to expand all over the globe. I don't want you staying in Eden. I want you to have children, and I want you to explore. I want you to fill. I want you to go to every corner of this earth that I made for you. I want you all over this creation. That's number two. Number three, subdue the earth. Subdue the earth. And this means that man was to use creation for his needs. Man was to study the creation. Study the plants, study the animals, study the weather. Study physics and engineering and geometry and all the things that are a part of the creation. Learn it and become the creation's master. Be able to get what you need out of the creation. When we go down and dig and we get oil out of the ground and we process it and we use it for energy to power our cars and, and uh, homes and electricity, that is subduing the earth. We are mastering the earth by doing that. Subdue the earth. And then finally, take charge and rule the animals. Have dominion. 
He was to take charge, rule over, and command the animal kingdom. Those are the four commands that God gave to to man in Genesis chapter 1. But what I want you to see now, remember we're talking about how man is the image and glory of God and how he is unique in a different way he shows the image and glory of God. What I want you to do now is see that in these four commands, the focus of these and the focus of this work is the man. Is the man. He was special in God's plan. Let me show you, again, we're going to use force today, four ways you can know that this man was the center of what God was doing and was a very special, special creation to God and his focus of of the work on the earth. Let's look at these four ways. And I think some of these are going to be fascinating to you. First of all, did you know that the man was created first? Now that's significant because God doesn't do anything without thinking about it for an eternity if we can just use that kind of vernacular. The infinite mind chose to make the man first. That is significant because every act of God, Genesis chapter 2 verse 7, God makes Adam and only later does he make the woman. We all know that the man and woman were made on day 6. But what most people don't realize is that for a great part of that day, only the man existed. The great part of that day, only the man existed. Let me help you understand this. First of all, on day six, what was made first? The land animals. So God, morning comes and God makes the land animals, right? Then He makes the man. And then in Genesis 2, we learn that God creates a garden in Eden and then He puts the man in it, instruction to be working. All this is happening in time. And then God brings the animals together, two by two, the kinds of animals, and He instructs Adam to name the animals, the animal kinds. Land animals only, no bugs and and crickets. Land animals and birds, no fish, okay? That alone would have taken hours. You see how, see the time passing? And then He lets Adam reflect and see that he's alone, and then He puts him to sleep, and then He makes the woman. You see, the whole day is gone before the woman is made. God is spending all these hours with the man. That is significant. God and Adam together for most of that day. Did you know that Adam named parts of creation? Adam named parts of creation. He named all the land animals and the birds. Think about that. He named woman. Genesis chapter 2. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman. Adam named woman. The helper God gave him. He named his wife, Genesis 3.20. Adam called her Eve because she's the mother of all the living. You see that? Why is that significant? Why is that significant? Because until the man was born, only God named things. Go to Genesis chapter 1. God names day and He names night. God names the heaven, the cosmos. He names the earth. He calls the water seas. See that? And later on in the Psalms we learn that God gave every star a name. But after man is created, God delegates this naming to the man. That's significant. And then finally, it's likely that God gave Adam dominion over the earth before the woman was created. Now, I don't have a lot of time to go into the detail of why I think this might be the case. And I emphasize might be. But you remember God gave other commands to Adam that he did not instruct the the woman. In Genesis chapter 2, he tells Adam, you don't eat from this tree. And then later, Adam has to tell his wife. God puts Adam in the garden and he starts working, implying he's already taking his dominion, which I think means God told him, You're going to have dominion over the earth. Let's get you in the garden and get you to work. And then Adam was later to instruct his wife in these things. So we have all of these things happen. He was created first. God spent most of the day with him. He was able to name creation. And he might have been given dominion directly without even God even telling the woman. What does that tell us? It tells us that the man was the special focus of God's creation. So what does it have to do with the statement, man is the image and glory of God? 
What does it have to do with that statement? This is cool stuff here. Think about this now. We've got to think more deeply about what's happening here. Because we read through the first few chapters of Genesis and we kind of skip over it like we know everything. But let's think about this. In order to expect this creature, a man, to be able to do all that he was commanded to do, God had to make him absolutely extraordinary, didn't he? Absolutely astonishing. Think about it. God had just given him the job of making a home in every corner of a globe 20,000 miles around. 123 billion acres is what there is in the world. He gave him the task of mastering an immensely complex natural world. And he gave him the challenge of reigning and ruling over an animal kingdom that included the T-Rex, the blue whale, and the lion. What would this man need to, to be like and to be able to do in order to accomplish all of this? Wouldn't he need great physical strength and ability? His body would have to be built to move things, wouldn't it? To lift things, to form things, to mold things. He would need joints and muscles and arms and legs capable of flexing and bending and reaching. If you ever worked on a car, you know God gave you a body that will flex and bend and reach. Wouldn't he need complex mental skill? Wouldn't he need to be able to do engineering and mathematics and physics? Wouldn't he need to plan and organize and create and imagine? Wouldn't he need to do that? Wouldn't he need enormous emotional power? Wouldn't he need drive to create? Drive to explore, drive to command. Mental toughness. He's not going to be overcome by obstacles. He's going to advance. He's going to dominate. He's got to have a strong mind and strong emotions, doesn't he? Wouldn't he need all of that? When God gives the man such remarkable qualities to carry out this task, who is he modeling the man's qualities after? Hmm? Hmm? Is he just imagining some higher being that man needs to be like? One that could only exist in God's imagination? No. When God makes man, and he makes him strong, and he makes him smart, and he gives him mental power and drive and toughness, he is making him like himself. For who has the power that God has? Who has the mental acuity that God had? Who has the emotional fortitude that God has? Who has the will that God has? When God made the man and said, I made you in my image, He said, I made you like me. You are like me, Adam. I made you like me. Not me, but like me. The glory of the man then is that His Creator has designed Him to be just like Him. And this is how the man is the image and glory of God. And today, if you were born a man, look at me young people, young men, if you were born a man, born with the body of your father Adam, you too, are God's image and glory. All that I have described about the man, you can be if you follow the Creator's design for your life. And if you ignore the voices out there telling you you don't want to be a man. If you're a born a man, embrace it. Do not wish to be anything else. You are a man. Live up to it. Accept the challenge of it and reap the benefits of being a man, the image and glory of God. Kent, you are the image and glory of God. Tyler, you are the image and glory of God. So where does this leave the woman? This is where the feminists are going to jump in and say, Oh, you Christians just down women. How is she the glory of man? And is that even something to be desired? Let's ask the question first. Why even make the woman? Why make the woman? If the man is so great, Wes, why did God even go to the trouble of making the woman? Because 
as capable as a man is, he is not in and of himself enough to do all the Creator gave him to do. In Genesis 2, 18, God says it this way. It is not good that man should be alone. Now I'm telling you, when the, when the God of creation, God Almighty says, it is not good. That means it is not good. He's saying as incredible a creation as I just made. The man by himself was not the measure of perfection, completeness. Something was lacking. Some addition was needed to complete this race of beings that would rule the earth. And that addition was woman. Genesis 2, 21 through 22 reads this way. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. The word woman in Hebrew is the female form of the word man. And that is exactly what a woman is. A woman is the female form, the female version of the man that God created. As the man was the perfect creation to do what he was intended to do, to lead the charge to spread out and dominate and rule the earth, so the woman was the perfect design for what she was intended to do. To accomplish his purpose in the woman, God took the design of the man and altered it. This is shown by him taking the man's rib and using it to make the woman. God was not starting from scratch to make the one that would complete the man. He was using the magnificent design he had already finished as the basis for this remarkable addition to humanity. The changes God made in her allowed the man to carry out the commands he was given. In some cases without her, men would not be able to complete those commandments at all. And in others, he would not be able to fully complete them. Remember the four commands. Without a woman, could these be done? Can you be fruitful and multiply without a woman? No, in order for the man to procreate and spread out, he had to have the woman. There can be no future generations without her. This is hinted at in the name Adam gave our first mother. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. What a compliment. What a, what a moniker to have by your name. Not Super Bowl MVP. Not winner of the uh, Kentucky Derby. But the mother of all living. There is no man about which that can be said, ladies. Let's look at the other three. <clears throat> what about the rest of these? Could he really do all of this alone? As anyone who has ever tried to accomplish any project of any size or complexity knows, you need help to do it. And that is why God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper. Comparable to him. Comparable to him. Not insubordinate or insufficient. The man needed help. My brothers who have been married, don't you need help? The man needed assistance. He needed support. He needed love. He needed encouragement. He needed a partner. He needed a soul man, soul, a soulmate. What he needed was a woman, isn't it? Together they were to obey the commands of God for their race and take on the task of raising godly children that will continue that into the future. In large part, the woman's assistance would center around the children. So God changed her body. He gave her organs for conceiving and carrying children. He gave her hips for giving birth to children. He gave her breasts for feeding children. And as a mother and helper, God gave her a greater sense of tenderness and kindness, 
what we, we refer to as a mother's love. Now, if you've had a good father, a godly father, you've had a good godly mother, there is a difference in the love of the father and of a mother, isn't there? That's because God designed it that way. It's not bad. He emphasized her traits of faithfulness and patience. So she could bear with and persevere with her children and husband. Whereas the man was hard charging and tough, she would be softer, gentler, more agreeable and understanding. And because she was not expected to labor in the same way as the man, God gave her a smaller frame. Women are generally smaller than men by design. She has less muscle, smaller bones, and narrower shoulders. <clears throat> but in every other way, and this is critical, she is his equal. Sharing his intelligence, his emotional strength, and his bodily perfection. She is a perfect alteration of a perfect design. And as such, she shows the greatness of the design that came before her. The human man God made to rule the earth. In this way, she is both the glory of God and the glory of man. Do you see that? And if you were born a woman, this is your purpose. This is why you were made the way you were. This is your meaning and this is your glory. Now finally, let's just go back to this last verse, the second one that I quoted. <clears throat> and let's get to this question that was asked earlier. Was your gender a mistake? The trans boy that we mentioned before thought he essentially was born into the wrong body. He said, Wes, I agree being a man or a woman is a great thing, but I'm just a woman in a man's body. Somehow who I am on the outside got confused with who I am on the inside. That's the argument. Well, my friend, you may be confused, but God Almighty is not confused. In the second verse I gave you early, he said something astonishing to Jeremiah. He said, before I formed you, I knew you. Before I ever wrapped your body, wrapped your soul, wrapped your spirit with a body, which was what Psalm 139 says, that He wraps a body around our soul, I knew and intended to make you what you are. I knew from the beginning of time, Peggy, that I was going to choose to make you a helper. You were going to be the perfect alteration of this design I called man. And then when you were born, I wrapped that body around you that was consistent with what I had always intended you to be. Young people, Carter, you, God had you in mind as a boy before you were ever born. And when you were conceived in your mother's belly and you were born into the world, you were exactly what you were supposed to be. Your gender is not a mistake. It is not confused, it is sure and certain. And it was given to you by Almighty God in heaven. Do not allow your flesh or the world to confuse you any longer. Be a man. Be a woman. Go forth. Be sure. Be satisfied. For a man is the image and glory of God. And the woman is the glory of man.